Welcome to Southridge. Would you join us as we worship today? Worthy of 
Every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you
control. You are king above all kings. You are the great and mighty Lord. And God, what a gift it is to be able to worship you. Jesus, thank you that we get to be in your heavenly presence. Would you fill us more and continue to guide us through each step, every journey, every season that we're in, God in every family, God, that is here with us, God, would you just bring comfort, bring peace, bring hope? Would you restore the way only you can? We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your mighty name. Amen.
Well, hey everyone, my name is Craig. I'm on staff here at Southridge and we made it. We're in 2021. It's so exciting. Obviously we can't meet in person yet, but we're excited hopefully sometime later this year to be able to finally meet with you guys in person again. Now, no matter who you are, whether you're at Southridge or it's your first time, you know, watching church online or you're at another church or somewhere else in the province, we're, well, we're excited you're here. We wanna welcome you here today. I have a couple quick things I wanna tell you about. Everything that I talk about is on our website. So if you wanna find out more about us, who we are, upcoming events, Events, giving online, anything like that, southridgefellowship.ca, all that information's there. We have a new uh, small group coming up, which is Life Explored. We're gonna be doing that with Pastor Wes. It's gonna be an awesome opportunity to look into some of the bigger questions of life. So if that's something that you're interested in, check out the website. You can find out more information about that there. As well, our message notes are all posted online. So as we go into our message coming up here with Brent, I'd encourage you to go check that out. You can download that, put it on your phone, whatever. It helps you uh, follow along with the message, take some notes. It's a great way to engage. Cage. And finally, I've forgotten the last announcement. <laughs> what was the last one? If you have kids in the Southridge Kids age group, which is up to grade five, we make dedicated videos for your whole family. I'd encourage you to check that out on our website, southridgefellowship.ca. As we prepare to listen to what Brent has to say in our message, let's take this opportunity just to get rid of any distractions, anything in our way so that we can hear what God has to say to us today. Chances are, if you are listening to this message, it's the first few days of 2021. And I've got to say, uh, in my entire lifetime, I don't think collectively we have been more happy to say sayonara to a year than this year in 2020. Um, if you could sum up the whole year, 2020, in one word, what word would you use? I've been talking to people and, and reading and words like surreal, unprecedented, uh, exhausting, chaotic, relentless, nightmare, dumpster fire have been thrown around. I loved what this one woman said in trying to describe 2020. It is the year of missing. And what she meant by that is, it's the year where we missed our family. It's the year where we missed our friends. It's the year where we missed the big celebrations. It's the year where we missed traditions. It's the year where we missed some of our freedoms and missed some of our safety. But I'm not sure anything tops nine-year-old Clark Smith who said it this way, 2020 is like looking both ways before crossing the street and then getting hit by a submarine because it has been the craziest year ever. One of the words that I've been using to describe 2020 has been the, the year, or the word disrupted. It has been a year where we have been disrupted over and over and over again. 2020 is the year where everything seemed to go out the window. It's the year that everything was turned upside down. It's the year where we were forced to experience things that we probably had never given a thought to, that we would ever have to face the kind of stuff we went to, through. And the thing is, just because we've flipped the calendar doesn't mean that things will get back to normal just because it's January 2021. In many ways, we have still quite a ways to go before things get back to what we would call normal. And so as I was thinking about this and as we were entering this new year, I was trying to think, how do I help our church continue to live in this disrupted pattern of life? How do I help our church have hope in the midst of all this loss that we have been suffering and will continue to suffer for more weeks ahead. How do we do that? And as I was praying about it, God led me to Daniel. And Daniel is a man whose life was turned upside down, and yet he still found a way to be faithful. Faithful to God in the midst of disruption. And I think Daniel has a lot to tell us, a lot to teach us. Even though he lived like 2,500 years ago and his circumstances were different, many of the things he went through, we face today. And so I want to start by looking at Daniel chapter 1. And we're going to read the first seven verses of the chapter. And this, these seven verses really set the stage for the entire chapter. And so let me start with the first two. And it says this. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, 
along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put them in the treasure house of his God. There's a couple of things going on in just these first two verses. They're part of the the meta story of the Bible, the overarching themes that you see when you read the entire word of God. And the first one of these is this relationship between God and Israel. And if you read the Old Testament, you will know that that relationship often was in trouble. And the Jews often did things that displeased God and didn't allow them to live up to their covenant covenant promise to God. And over and over again, God would come to them through his prophets and say, look guys, Israel, my children, if you do not live the way I've asked you to live and the way you promised to live with the covenant that we made, I am going to discipline you. And so in this verse, in chapter two, or in, the cha- in verse two of chapter one, when it says the Lord delivered Jehoiakim to the Babylonians, what it is saying there is that God was disciplining Israel for the years and decades and even centuries of disobedience. And it was a day that God had been warning them about. And so you have this little glimpse of God's word being fulfilled to them. And then it moves into another aspect of the meta narrative of the Bible where this, this theme runs through it, where there, there is a spiritual battle between God and everyone else who wants to be God. And whether it's men or other spiritual beings. And you see this reference first in the term of Babylonia. When Daniel says that these articles and these people eventually are taken to Babylon, some of your versions may have Shinar instead of Babylonia. And that brings us back into Genesis, Genesis chapter 11. And if you know Genesis chapter 11 at all, it's the story of the Tower of Babel. And in that story, the Tower of Babel is built on the plains of Shinar, the birthplace of Babylonia. And in that story, the people of that era get into trouble for their pride and their wanting to be great. And this theme of pride and man's greatness will be carried out in, and dealt with in the book of, of Daniel. But there's other, another thing going on in this first two verses. And I call it capture the flag theology. You see, in Daniel's day, they, the nations had a theology uh, where each of them had their own gods. And they would have their different names for their different gods. And when the nations came to war against each other, whatever nation won meant, and this was their belief, that their God had overthrown the other nation's gods. And to demonstrate that and to prove that and to remind everyone, what they would do is when the nation conquered another nation, they would go into that nation's temple, take the the idol of their God, which was usually made of gold, and remove it from that temple and take it back to their own city, their own temple, their own God's temple, and put that idol in their God's temple. And it was a way to show that their God was superior to the other nation's God and had defeated the other nation's God because they could take the idol and put it there. Notice, though, in verse 2 here, where it says that there was no idol taken because the Jews weren't allowed to make idols. That's in direct violation of the commandments that God gave to the Jewish people. And so what could Nebuchadnezzar do to show that he was superior, that his God was superior to the Jewish gods? He would take the articles of the temple back to Babylon. And we'll see that these articles actually play a role in chapter 5, where God is showing the Babylonians that he is still God. And the key verse of this whole book is verse 2, where it says, And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the Babylonians. You see, from the perspective of the world, from the perspective of Nebuchadnezzar, his perspective would have been that he conquered the Jews and that his God beat the Jewish God, Yahweh. But Daniel is letting us into a little secret, into something that is not readily apparent to everyone, that God is the author behind this, that he is the one that delivers his people to the Babylonians. And this lesson we will be continually taught throughout the book of Daniel. And it's this lesson that in spite of what things look and how things appear, God is still in control. And, he, and his plan for redemption is, will, won't be hindered. It's still in progress. 
Even when things look hopeless, even when things look down, even when things look their darkest, God is still working behind the scenes. And that's really the story of Daniel. God is still at work. And sometimes he does this subtly, like in chapter 1 where you see it in verse 2, and then later on in verses 9 and 17 where it tells us that God granted them favor or God gave uh, them wisdom not readily apparent to everyone. Or sometimes it's dynamic and you have the fiery furnace and the lion's den and the handwriting on the wall. In every single chapter, God shows up to show people that he is still in control of what has happened. And this is a reminder that in the meta-narrative of the gospel, in the meta-narrative of the Bible, that no matter what it looks like, God is still there. And it's a good lesson for us to be, to be reminded of. God operates in ways that we don't think he should. Oftentimes when we face our enemies and whether it's a nation or an individual or maybe it's a sickness, we want God to act powerfully to come in and just blow everything away and make everything right and bring justice right in that moment. And yet so often God doesn't do that. He operates on his own schedule. He operates with his own way of dealing with things. And oftentimes he doesn't do the supernatural. He works within the limitations of the creation that he has created. And that often leaves us mystified, confused, and sometimes even angry. Because we want God to show up. And we think that God will gain the greatest glory when he does that. But so often God operates in entirely different ways. And in part, Daniel shows this to us. Daniel continues in verse 3 to show us that the meta narrative is important, but there is always the personal narrative. And millions and billions of people live their lives, and God interacts with the personal, the individual. It's not just about the big picture. And so you find in verse 3 when it says this Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz his chief of his uh, court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude of every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service." Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, to Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Think about this. We learn some crazy things about Daniel in these passages. The first is this, that the, Daniel and his three friends uh, they suffer through a terrible experience, the exile. Basically, their city is surrounded, it's sieged, it's fought against, and they're ultimately captured and then carted away. Their world is turned upside down. It is disrupted. And I th we kind of get a little bit of a glimpse of that in what we've gone through in the last year, but Daniel's is so much worse, so much more impactful. It's not like a year of his life or a year and a half of his life. His entire life, is upended and changed. And not only does he have to change of where he's living and enter into a new culture, the way he worships God changes. Because you see, no longer would he be able to go to the temple with the rest of the Jews and offer sacrifices every week and uh, worship God that way. In essence, in essence, he like us over this last nine months has experienced a new way of trying to do discipleship, trying to maintain our relationship with God. At Southridge, we would talk about losing our ability to celebrate big together. That's what Daniel did. And it wasn't for a few months, it was for his entire life. And so he had to figure out ways to stay in his relationship with God where the biggest one, the most important one to him, the celebrating big at the temple piece was suddenly ripped away. And so all these things he has to deal with. And yet there's even more that he has to deal with. And sometimes reading it, we're not really, we don't see it right away until we dig a little deeper. Notice this. We, you see, Nebuchadnezzar 
is offering these guys basically a full ride scholarship to Babylon U. Three years, everything paid for, and at the end, if you pass, you get a job, a lifetime job working for the king. And in these verses, we learn four things about Daniel and his friends. One, that they were nobly born, that they were probably even related and a direct descendant of the king. Uh, this probably is a fulfillment of the prophecy we find in Isaiah 39, 7, where the prophet Isaiah tells uh, King Hezekiah that someday in the future, some of his descendants will be taken to Babylon and they will live there and serve the king of Babylon. And so you have these Jewish descendants, probably of Hezekiah, who are now in Babylon. We also find out that they're young. The Hebrew word that is used here uh, implies that they're probably teenagers, 13, 14, 15, maybe 16 years old, meaning that they are still moldable, still impressionable. They're still learning. But it also tells us that they're handsome. They're good looking. These are the kind of guys that all the girls thought were cute in Hebrew school. And it also tells us that these guys were incredibly smart. They're intelligent. They are the top of their class. And Nebuchadnezzar takes these young men and takes them to Babylon. And what may not be apparent to you when you first read this is this. He is trying to indoctrinate them into Babylon culture. He removes them from Jerusalem. He removes them from their families. He removes them from their Jewish identity and is trying to immerse them in the Babylonian culture and, and turn them into Babylonians. And there's a number of reasons why he would do that. You see, he's a guy who's gone bent on world domination. His kingdom is expanding and he would need conquered people to run these nations. And so part of it is he's trying to raise up people who would believe in the Babylonian ideals and then serve him. He might even be taking them in the first part to be hostages so that it would guarantee that the Jewish people would behave, those he left behind. But you see this indoctrinational process. It starts in verse 4 where it tells us that they had to learn the Babylonian language, which would have been Aramaic. That's what they would have spoken. But they also had to learn a different language, the, the language that all the literature was in. So they had two languages to learn. And then there's this phrase that they had to learn the literature of the Babylonians or the Chaldeans. And what this meant was that they'd have to learn mathematics, they'd have to learn astronomy, but they would also have to learn the arts of divination. You see, divination was huge for Babylonians. That included astrology. It included interpreting dreams, which we'll find out about later on in Daniel. It included divining signs and omens by examining sheep livers and looking at things, differences in sheep livers to figure out what portents were coming and what the gods were saying. And much of what they would have to learn and been forced to learn and been forced to excel in would have been forbidden for a Jew to learn. And so they're, they're, they're brought into this culture that is trying to take away who they are. And then you have this verse in verse 5 where it tells us that they were fed from the king's table, meaning that they got the best food in the land. But even more than that, what it meant that if they were eating from the king's table, they would be showing that they were uh, vassals of the king, they were subservient to the king, and they were relying on the king to provide for them as opposed to their God to provide for them. And then, of course, the last thing in verse 7, you see the name change. And this was really done. They were given new names, really, as a sign, the ultimate sign, that their God was no longer part of their lives. Because you see, all four of these individuals, their names had a tie to the Hebrew God, Yahweh. You have Daniel, which his name means God is my judge. Or Hananiah, and his name means God has been gracious or Mishael, who, who is like God, or Azariah, God is my helper. And their names were changed and replaced with names that reflected the Babylonian gods. Belteshazzar means either Bel's prince, which Bel was the chief uh, god of the Babylonians, or the keeper of the hidden treasure of Bel. Shadrach's name uh, means, or was connected to their sun god. Meshach mean, was connected to their earth goddess, and then Amednego was 
connected to their God of wisdom, their fire God, the shining fire. And so in that one swoop, what the Babylonians were trying to do and say is that you are no longer connected to your God. You are now connected to the Babylonian gods. Daniel and his friends had to live in a culture that wasn't just secular, it was evil. You read in uh, Revelation chapter 18 where it talks about Babylon and everything that it talks about it is not good. It talks about wickedness, it talks about demons, it talks about evil. And that is the place that Daniel and his friends find himself in. They were called to excel in a culture that stood against everything they believed in and they excelled. They were, they found themselves in a world that did everything in its power to lead them away from God. And yet they didn't go away from God. They found themselves in an environment that was full of temptations, whether it was luxury, good food and wine, or even access to the most powerful man in the world at that time. And they were able to keep their character Like us, Daniel had events thrust on him that he had no control over. And yet he had to learn to live within those events. And so how was Daniel able to do that? And I think he he was able to do it because he understood one simple thing. That when God is in control, and God is in control, there is always hope. Even in the darkest days, With God, there is always hope. And that history is really just the unfolding of God's redemptive plan. You see, God, I believe, has hardwired hope into us, into our very soul. It's been imprinted in us as humans. And even godless people cling to hope in their life to get through life. The Washington Post uh, recently asked a bunch of people, they surveyed a bunch of people and just said, hey, what is your hope for the year 2021? And they got a ton of responses. But the top two responses that came in were this. People hoped that there would be a vaccine and that it would get out to people and and we'd get to a place where we would be okay from COVID. And then the second hope would would be that life would get back to normal. And what they meant by that is that when life would be back to normal, they're hoping that we would be able to get back to doing things that we like to do, that we appreciate. And whether it's like Ines Silva who said, I just want to be able to hug someone, anyone, without uh, fearing to hug people. To be able to treasure an ordinary action. Or whether it's like Maddie Smith uh, from St. Louis who just said, I want real in-person graduation, not some slideshow. You know, that return to celebrating things. Or maybe it's the return to the comfortable, where we don't have others dictating what we can or cannot do. We, where everything feels safe, where changes don't disrupt our lives like every second day or every week, where we feel comfortable, where we know what's coming ahead, where we can predict kind of what the next couple of months look like. In other words, when people say they want things to get back to normal, what I think they're saying is this, they want to get back to what, every, what the average person's goal in North America is, is to live a life of comfort, where they're in control, where they know what is going to happen next week, where they dictate what is going on. And yet here's the thing, comfortable people don't need Jesus. Disrupted people need Jesus. And the hope that we have to offer our world as Christians is this. We live in a world where the resurrection has happened. You see, on that day, Good Friday, when the crucifixion took place, the world thought, I think even Satan thought, that God had been defeated. Just like Nebuchadnezzar thought that Yahweh had been defeated. And yet Sunday rolls around and shows that God's redemptive plan has not been stopped. The resurrection happened. And because of that, we have hope even in a world that is full of disruption. You see, with the resurrection, God disrupted everything. And he showed that he is ultimately in control. The word disruptive 
is a verb, and it generally means bad things. But the word disruptive is an adjective, and it can be both negative and positive. In the positive sense, it can mean innovation. It can mean groundbreaking. It can mean unconventional. It can mean revolutionary. It can mean radical. And I believe that God has been working in our disrupted year of 2020, and he will continue to work in this year of 2021. He will continue to use the gospel, which is disruptive, because it changes people's lives. It comes in and challenges people with their point of view, their expectations, their belief system, to challenge them to put their focus on God. Challenging people to understand that God is in control and that his plan for history has not stopped. It is continuing to unfold. And I wonder, I wonder what if 2020 was the way it was because God was preparing you for something disruptive in 2021. What if, what if God is calling you to instead of returning to normal, comfortable life in 2020, instead he is calling you to live a disruptive gospel life in 2021. What if everything we've been through is just a preparation for the year to come? Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm excited for what you have to teach us through the book of Daniel as we go through it over the next few weeks. There is so much in this book. But most of all, God, I am just thankful for the reminder that Daniel gives us that you are in control no matter what happens in our life, no matter how disrupted our life becomes. And not only are you in control, that your plan of redemption continues to march forward through the gospel. And ultimately, you ask us to live in a, in a life that is in many ways disruptive to our society. A society that calls us, tempts us to walk away from you. It challenges us to discount who you are. And so God, I pray for our church as we enter into 2021. I pray that you would continue to work in us as you have for the past year. I pray that as we move into this year, that as a church, we would not go back to normal, comfortable life, but that we would search out and seek out how we might be disruptive with the gospel for 2020. And Lord, may you blow us away this year with what you're going to do in our lives and through us in Langley in this world. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for being part of our service today and joining us today. And I would just want to say and wish you a happy new year as we go into 2021. Uh, may God bless you this, this year.